It's my nerd world, and welcome to it. It's episode 162. I am your host, John Justice, here parched in the dry, dry desert of a lack of official Star Wars Episode 9 information, and my thirst can only be quenched by the positivity of the Raylo fandom. Okay, that was weird. On the show this week, uh, Docking Bay 94, really interesting uh, Star Wars podcast, conducted an interview uh, that we are going to talk briefly about. Uh, specifically, does Lucasfilm go and put false information out into the, the fandom? They did, and I think that they still do. Also, on the show this week, we're going to discuss a bit about the the influence of the director on the film. And the lack of attention that I believe it personally deserves. Also, on this week's show, in the listener feedback portion of this week's show, I stumbled upon a really interesting theory. And I'm looking forward to hearing your response on this theory and even debunking it if I'm wrong. A ton of listener feedback, as always, this week. Let's not waste any more time and get right to it. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. Calling to you. My nerd road. Just bet it in. Glad you're with the show again this week. I hope you're having yourself a uh, fantastic day, weekend, whenever it is that you actually decide to go and listen to My Nerd World. A Star Wars podcast. As I said at the start of the show, I am your host, John Justice, and am uh, happy, as always, that you've taken time out of your busy schedule to listen to me rattle on and babble on about Star Wars for 45 minutes plus. So, still no information on Episode 9, right? Taking a cue from what has been done with the marketing of uh, Endgame, right? Uh, I want to be your end game. Uh, uh, we're not talking to Taylor Swift or uh, Ben Solo, but we're talking Avengers Infinity War. Uh, I get the eerie feeling, uh, and I'm 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 not necessarily looking forward to this if it ends up being the case, but I'm getting the eerie feeling that the marketing for Episode Nine is going to be very close to what they're doing with um, Avengers Endgame. Disney knows that with Avengers Endgame, they don't need to give that much away in order for people to go and see this movie based off of what happened in Infinity War. This is not a Marvel podcast. I'm getting to the Star Wars stuff. Please hold on to your hyperdrive and just bear with me. So, um, you know, we're a couple of weeks out from uh, from Endgame being released, and they dropped the full trailer. If you've watched the full trailer for Endgame, there ain't much there. It's actually very much alike what myself and many others have speculated the Episode Nine teaser should be. This is the full trailer. The whole first half of that Avengers Endgame trailer is just old footage shot in black and white with red accented parts of the frame for each of the remaining not caught in the snap, spoiler alert, um, Avengers and then you get to the actual footage from from Endgame, not you, Ben, and there's no action. <laughs> they're, very, they're very minimal clips, not really showing much in the same heck of anything. Uh, it doesn't matter. Everyone's going to go see the movie, and therein lies the point. I guess the Russo brothers, and I don't know if any of this is true. This is the internet speaking, and when does the internet ever lie? But uh, the Russo brothers, the, the, the rumor is they only gave those cutting the trailer like eight minutes worth of footage to play with, and it was all from the first act of the film. Now, Episode Nine is not Avengers Endgame. These are two different franchises, similar fan bases, crossover fan base, obviously. That being said, the, the way the MCU has been set up is much different than 
the Star Wars series of movies in a variety, a plethora of ways that I'm not going to get into right now. But it just it's a different beast than Star Wars. The only thing, one of the, well, two, two, a couple of things that they do have in common, uh, both done by Disney, uh, both the culmination of a bunch of movies leading to a finale. The difference with Endgame is we do know those stories are going to go on, just like we know the Star Wars stories are going to go on. Uh, but we also know that an extension of many of the stories from actual Endgame will end up going on to be the next part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. With Star Wars, we just don't know that. We know these other trilogies are being made by these other directors, but we don't know what the time frame is going to be. And right now, when it comes to the films, we don't know what's going to happen after Episode Nine. Now, Star Wars has the added benefit of this is the final movie of this nine arc saga. So even though The Last Jedi did not have the cliffhanger that Endgame did, there is still going to pl be plenty of justification for fans to flock to the theaters to see Star Wars Episode Nine, despite the minority of the fan base that hates The Last Jedi, and despite the, the, the lack of any definitive cliffhanger at the end of, of The Last Jedi. So getting back to... The point that I was trying to make is that Endgame trailer is minimal to the point where I was actually like disappointed. They gave you so little to chew on. And we're only a couple weeks out from, I mean, we're what, three weeks? No, four, four weeks, five weeks out. About five weeks out from from the debut of Endgame in the, in the theaters a uh, week before Celebration when we should get the teaser trailer. I'm, I'm just wondering if because we haven't gotten the title. This is a long-winded way to get to my to my ultimate point. Because we haven't gotten a title yet for Episode 9, I wonder if they're using the same marketing campaign like they did with Avengers, where they didn't release the title until the first teaser trailer. And that first teaser trailer was very minimal. I don't expect the teaser trailer or the full trailer to be as sparse as Endgame, just because I feel like Disney and Lucasfilm specifically need, they've got to give the fans something to chew on. And I know looking at the Marvel fan base and not listening to, but just sort of reading around the edges of the commentary and podcasts surrounding the Marvel Cinematic Universe, because I do enjoy it. I, I watch those films um, quite often, actually. Uh, I usually use them as a stopgap when I, <laughs> between watching Star Wars movies to make it feel more justified when I go and revisit um, Star Wars, uh, Star Wars again. But looking at the fandom, they can obviously go and pull a lot of stuff from those particular trailers. But I really do believe that they've been starving the fandom for so long now. The Star Wars fandom, they got, they got to give us something that a little bit got got a little more meat on the bones than what they were able to get away with for Avengers Endgame. Uh, because everybody wants to know what ends what ends up happening, I, I, and again, I, I for, for the moment I don't like this 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 marketing, and that is just from the moment. Um, I know Disney doesn't necessarily. Eh, I don't want to say they don't care, but in 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 uh, in level of importance, right? The hardcore fandom, you listening to this show, me producing this show, we're gonna go see Star Wars Episode Nine regardless. So. Disney and Lucasfilm can afford to frustrate minorly individuals like myself that are clamoring, right? That are just that are drying out in this desert, right? <clears throat> There's nothing in the desert, and no man needs nothing. Um, or just just parched in this desert, wanting Star Wars information. Um, but for the general fan base, the longer that they can wait, obviously, I think it's a benefit to Disney and Lucasfilm. Because when it does pop up, then you're going to have a fan base that's as far away from what happened with Solo and how close Solo and The Last Jedi were uh, to, together. Okay, So all that being said, it brings me to the first sort of topic this week. Uh, and there's not a lot, uh, you know, I always say this, like I don't have a lot of like discussion part of the show this week because we have a lot of listener feedback and there's no news. I say that, but you know that I'm going to end up r rambling off another half hour before I get to listener fan base, uh, listener feedback. But be that as it may, a um, couple of weeks ago, these are a, little, like, a few items left over from last week's show that I didn't get a chance to get to. Uh, listening to Doc, uh, to Docking Bay 94, which is a really good podcast. The, uh, the, the individual that hosts that show uh, goes out and finds people to interview from the Star Wars past. Really fascinating stuff, too, um, on, on all kinds of different levels. Former, uh, you know, character uh, characters in the original trilogy. Um, this past week was one of the uh, one of the uh, 
one of the artists that's worked on the prequels uh, and the and the most recent films. That was a really fascinating interview uh, that he did. It's the kind of stuff that I wish that the Disney show was doing more often. And I'll argue this point just because I'm close to what I just said. I'll keep saying this. The, the Star Wars Disney show could really, really benefit by catering to the hardcore fan base and just bringing somebody in with production of the film without even having to get into any detail of what's going on. Just talk about the 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 the, the art making process. Use the Force Awakens material as reference. I, I just think there's so many better options than what they end up doing. And I know that that show is supposed to pe- appeal to a larger audience. I think, but I don't know. I just feel like the Star Wars show should have a little bit more inside baseball stuff on it than they than they do. But again, I'm the hardcore fan that's doing on episode 162 of his uh, his Star Wars podcast. Okay, but on Docking Bay 94 a couple of weeks ago, uh, the host of the show had on a person who was in charge of the the Star Wars um, Lucasfilm fan club for the original trilogy. Really, really interesting stuff. I am fascinated by the impact that social networking is having on our society. Um... I, I really am. It's one of those things where if I ever were to write a book beyond the sci-fi stories that I'm telling in my Embark series, I, I would I would try to compile a book based off of my experiences of navigating social media, being a radio talk show host full time um, from the time when I was hosting before Twitter came along. And I'm really just talking about Twitter before Twitter came along and then. Up until now, where Twitter drives so much of the narratives, not just in our news cycle uh, and in the social sphere, but also the fandom on almost every single level. I am I am fascinated by this. What I thought was most interesting about this interview with this former um, the the, the guy that took care of the, the Star Wars fandom during the original trilogy was he admitted. He admitted that he put out a fake article that ended up in a magazine. So this was prior to the Empire Strikes Back. And he was writing an article for, I want to say it was Starlog. For those that have been around long enough, I know the magazine I'm talking about. I don't think it's around anymore. Uh, Definitely wasn't wasn't, uh, Cinefix magazine, which is a fantastic magazine still around, by the way. Um, And a lot of this... I was drawn into it at an early age, not just because of my Star Wars fandom, but because my brother um, used to work for a production studio, a few of them, um, in essentially Hollywood, but out in Southern California, uh, doing special effects work for, for movies and for commercials. Did that for many years. Now he actually has his own, his own business where he restores um, artifacts for Disney collectors. Anyway, um, but he was really, really um, sort of in Hollywood and the... And the, the, the movie making and miniature making process at the time and got me interested also in sort of the, the, the behind the scenes stuff. But this guy on, on Document 94 talked about this article that he wrote for this magazine. And he basically put out a whole bunch of details. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't writing it as the guy that works for Lucasfilm, Right. He was writing it as somebody else, basically putting out propaganda where it had a list of things that could be in The Empire Strikes Back but were not. And then also in there were a few things that actually were in the film. And I was shocked to hear this guy admit this. Not only that, but he ended up replying to his own article so he if i understand the story correctly he put the article out anonymously okay and then he ended up replying as a member of lucasfilm to the article to neither confirm or deny anything that was in the article so i'm listening to this interview and and i'm legit surprised that this former Lucasfilm employee is admitting to being employed by Lucasfilm and putting out false information. Okay. I follow way too much nonsense on on Reddit when it comes to Star Wars. I'm checking the Reddit speculation and leaks page multiple times uh, throughout the day. And 
it's really interesting that sometimes there are these these supposed doing that thing with my fingers leaks that come out, and then they, they seem completely legit. And there was the one recently, and I covered it extensively on the show, where this individual that clearly had some inside information, that clearly somehow was a part of the production, he claimed that he was an extra. But he, the, the dude just had info, and it was backed up by other individuals that have credible sources like MakingStarWars.net. Right. Okay. But then his story like fell apart. Like he started going and putting out a whole bunch of speculation and coupling it with the real stuff. And then it just kind of gotten all, it got all convoluted. Nobody believes him anymore. He still goes and posts, but everybody just immediately dismisses him. And this isn't like a Mike Zero situation. Okay. So, and this, this has happened before. I mean, and there are legitimate leaks, like what happened with The Force Awakens, where the shooting schedule got leaked, and a couple of different sites had it, and were slowly going and, and releasing uh, information. But then you just, you get these ones, and you kind of go, wow, there's a lot of legitimacy to, to this stuff. And then it actually gets somewhat confirmed, and it's never like all of it, for the most part. There was another person who claimed to be out at a, 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 a marketing meeting, where they revealed some stuff for the for the films. And some of that ended up being legit, some of which hasn't been completely confirmed yet. Like he talked about seeing a silver a silver and a silver logo, like kind of on black for uh for Star Wars episode 9. Then we get just this week, just as another example and what I'm leading towards. We get this it looks like uh, what is supposed to be like a one sheet for advertising. OK, and on this on this one sheet for for advertising. Right. It's an alleged marketing leak. And it's really, really interesting to look at. Somebody posted this up and it was it was on 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 one one of the uh, on the imager. And it's the Star Wars logo. It's two different panels and it's got all these different ways of showcasing the Star Wars logo with the title The Only Hope. And it has all of these details surrounding this. On top, it has the Star Wars logo. On bottom, it has a Lucasfilm logo that many people have said points to the fact that it's a fake because it's the same logo, but the doesn't the, the the most recent logo that Lucasfilm has been using doesn't use the shadow box effect on the lettering, even though the logo looks exactly the same. But look, I mean, if somebody went and faked this, right? And I'm looking. I'm actually looking at it right now. Uh, somebody went and faked this thing. I mean, they went way out of their way. So reading some of this, um, as noted in Section Q, efforts should be made to ensure pre-theatrical release branding is always on a dark background. In the event, branding for pre-theatrical release must be displayed on a light background following the parameters must apply. Then there's these different codes that are involved that has and are all labeled different figures, figure E, figure C, branding uh, for run-up to theatrical release. You have branding one week post-theatrical release. Uh, it's all really, it looks all really legit, right? Again, hat tip to the person who faked this thing if it's not real. Okay, so going back to that guy that was interviewed on Docking Bay 94, it's stuff like this that convinces me that Disney and Lucasfilm are still doing this type of stuff. And pulling from my own experience covering national news, national and local news on my news talk show, uh, you know, it's not just people like Russians and foreign entities that are trying to influence social networking, right? Everybody does. That's why there are social networking influences out there and businesses are doing stuff all the time to test products. I'm convinced that stuff like this alleged marketing leak, I'm not saying that the only hope is the right title. If it is, I'm fine with that. But I'm convinced that that a part of the marketing plan for Disney and Lucasfilm is also centered around putting out some legit information along with misinformation to feed the fandom that does podcasts like me and listens to podcasts like like you. If you go back and look, and what's interesting about it is 
Like when, um, and again, I'll use the, 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 the news talk world as a really, really good example. Um, and this is in no way, shape, or form. I'm not going to give my opinion. I'm just going to use this as an example because it's a perfect example. Um, so John Brennan came out a couple weeks ago, and she was on, or he was on, uh, Rachel Maddow's uh, show, saying that he expected the, the Mueller report on Trump to be released um, not this past Friday, but the Friday before. Said he had no information in regards. Yes, I have no, I have no inside information about whether or not it's going to. But you know, Mueller is go- not going to be released. Mueller was going to indict more people. So Mueller's going to drop the indictment on new people coming up this Friday, and I'm convinced it'll be this Friday. And Maddow asks Brennan, "Well, why this Friday?" He's like, "Because he won't want to do it next week because um, it's uh, it'll be March 15th, and that's the Ides of March, and you don't want to do it on the Ides of March." Okay. I even made the joke live on the air that he sounds like me trying to deduce when the episode nine title was going to be released. Nobody ever follows up on that. Okay. And this isn't, and everybody does this. Um, But when people go and put out like predictions like that, there's never like a look back after the time passes. You may have a few people point out, Hey, he was wrong. But other than that, we kind of just move on with, with, with life. And there's no, there's no follow up. And rarely is there any follow-up when an actual teaser trailer drops that stops the conversation of speculation about the teaser trailer. Rarely do does anybody ever go back and look at their reports prior to try to figure out if there was anybody that actually turned out to be correct in their predictions in the first place. And I'm convinced that if you were to go back and look at some of the major leaks that have taken place over the course of the three sequel trilogies, to a lesser extent, Rogue One, there was some stuff that was out there. But when it comes to The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and Episode Nine, if you looked at some of the legitimate leaks that got out there, I am, I, I'm, I, again, I'm more and more convinced that they're the doing of Lucasfilm just to feed the fandom that's paying close attention something to, to nibble on. Right. Like 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 the the sheet that we got of all the snaps of concept art and the character design designs. Right. That ended up leaking out that I posted on the podcast. How is it that something leaks out that ends up being so benign and doesn't spoil anything? Think about that for for just a second. We get these leaks. But when was the last time there was a legitimate leak? that actually revealed something major about a film. Now, again, this is despite what happened with The Force Awakens for those that were paying attention. I don't know anybody that got what was going to happen in in Episode Eight completely right, and there was a lot of speculation involved there. Everything that's been, that's been leaked so far for Episode Nine has all been very surface-level stuff. The behind-the-scenes shots, yeah, just, okay. You can see what Poe Dameron and Finn are wearing and the, the grass on the, on, the, on the grassy knoll that they're standing on, what it looks like, okay? You've got the, the marketing leak where it talks about what some of the focus might be when it comes to the to, to the marketing, which doesn't seem too surprising, you got the one sheet that had all the character designs, some concept art, a picture of Dio that's supposed to be BB-8's sidekick. Again, all on the surface level. This leak about the potential title being the only hope. What if Disney and Lucasfilm were still struggling on what they were going to call the movie and they floated the only hope out there to get a gauge off the fandom? I'm convinced that happens. And it makes all the sense in the world that this alleged marketing leak for the only hope. And I will put this up. I'm actually going to pull the pull the picture down right now. I'll put this up in my um in the link to um to, it doesn't show up on all of the different versions, um but I'll put this up uh, on the uh, in the show notes for the podcast uh, for the podcast this week so that you and so that you can go in and check it out for yourself. That to me seems a heck of a lot more likely. That somebody at Disney and Lucasfilm put together, threw together this this makeshift sort of one sheet of the way the logo is supposed to look and put a lot of official sounding jargon on it, but made it look just enough to where the fandom can pick it apart just to get the fandom talking about something. I, 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 I'm totally, totally convinced that that makes a heck of a lot more sense than some somebody dummying up a, a copy like this something like this just to go in and 
you know, pull a pull a trick on the fandom. I mean, usually with stuff like that, you put together, a, you know, a, a thread and you can go and comment and sort of perpetuate your, your lie. I've never done that, but I know people obviously apparent or at least apparently get a kick out of doing stuff like that because you see it happen all the time. So let's talk for just a moment about The Only Hope, because that's the name of the title that was on this marketing lead, okay? Uh, I don't think it's going to be the title of the movie. Um, one, if this was done by a fan who was trying to trick everybody, then obviously it's not going to be the title. Two, if you're Disney and Lucasfilm, are you going to go so far as to actually release the title, right? To the fandom, or are you going to give like the potential for a title to the fandom and let them go and play with it, knowing all along that you'll give the fans something to talk about at least for a little while until we get the the actual you know name of the movie and the trailer as well. Um, that leak also came at a really interesting time because it was kind of a right around the time this past week when I thought that the that the title name could drop. Uh, with Captain Marvel being out now, we'll still we got four weeks away from Celebration, where we're supposed to go and get the uh, the the name drop and the teaser. If they don't, I'm convinced the fans are going to go and riot. Um, and then we get this really interesting looking leak about the Only Hope. Okay, so if that is the title, I am completely fine with it. I think it's a really fitting way to end the nine series saga. I think this movie, along with the title, are both going to be fascinating to see not just the story, obviously, the most important part of it, but just to see the decisions that are made to attempt to put a bow on these nine movies. Return of the Jedi did a great job of wrapping up the series. And and I've heard a lot of people argue that, you know, the uh, the, the sequel trilogy wasn't really necessary. And if you if you were to ask me, um, I, I, I probably would have preferred the sequel trilogy with the same characters and even plot line be less focused on the original trilogy, right? And and it really kind of is. And I think that plays into a lot of the reason why a lot of fans have a, have a, I said a lot, a lot, um, why many fans have such a hard time with the sequel trilogy because a lot of them feel like it's not a worthy extension of the stories we told before. And I, in my opinion, that's just a an unwillingness to accept the fact that Disney and Lucasfilm wanted to make a 7, 8, and 9, but it really was wanting to bring in a whole host of new characters to set the stage for the future. I, I'm convinced of that. And so I, I will not say they shoehorned any of the original trilogy in. I don't think that happened at all. I think this was a very sort of natural progression. Uh, but you also could have set this further out and away from the from the Skywalker story. So I do not envy what J.J. Abrams and Chris Terrio have to do with trying to wrap up this trilogy in a way that is satisfying, and I don't envy them trying to come up with a title for this movie because I don't know what title is going to make everybody happy. Clearly, by the response of people that were looking at The Only Hope, um, not everybody was in, was in agreement with, <laughs> with, with that title. Now, again... If it's not for social networking, going full circle, we don't even know any of this. You basically just get your opinion and you see the only hope. Hey, that looks good. That looks bad. And you move on with life. But now we get to constantly see other people's reaction when we go and read this stuff on threads. Okay, so this brings me to another quick discussion I wanted to have before we dive into uh, listener listener feedback this week. This whole... Um, this whole discussion and the the talk around the title potentially being um, the 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 only hope um, brought back a theory in my mind that I really really like and I want to visit it again and ask you to comment on whether or not this would well let's do this something inside me has always been there. And I was awake. And I need help. The title, The Only Hope, takes me immediately back to Help Me, One, uh, help me, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, You're My Only Hope. The writer for Entertainment Weekly, uh, Anthony Bresnikan, uh, who handles the Star Wars coverage, back when The Force Awakens came out, he wrote a, a lengthy article, and I think this was prior to The Force Awakens coming out, talking about how he thought that Ray would be a Kenobi. And 
if I had one complaint of this trilogy so far, uh, not even a complaint, but if, if I was going to find a complaint, I would say that there needs to be more Obi-Wan Kenobi. I know we got the force back scene. These are your first steps. We obviously got Ben Solo named after Obi-Wan Kenobi. But his presence in the original trilogy, his presence in, I mean, in the prequel trilogy, his pregnant, his, his presence in the original trilogy, I, I, I just, you cannot understate their importance. And thinking about, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope. Thinking about the movie being called The Only Hope. Thinking about race parentage and whether or not J.J. Abrams had originally mapped out who her parents were going to be, if anybody, when they started on this journey of creating new Star Wars content. I really like the idea of her being a Kenobi. And I don't think it takes much to get there when it comes to explanation. Uh, I don't think that it's something that requires a lot of depth or even time on screen, just more of a of a sort of revelation. I do think there are still questions that I would like to see answered, and there's a part of me that thinks that if they're not answered, will that, over the long term of looking back at these movies, end up affecting my viewing of it? And Ray being on Jakku, why was Ben telling the truth? Did Ray really know the truth about her about her parents? Why was the Falcon? How did the Falcon end up actually being there too in the connection that it has? I am willing to accept that's just what happened. I am I'm willing to. I'm willing to accept that if that's what they're going to do. I will look past it and I will move on with life. But if you were to go and start dissecting the films, that's a question that I, I think is very relevant and worthy of an on-screen answer. It just seems very convenient that that famed ship, the Millennium Falcon, happened to be right there on the same planet that this light that rises ends up you know, leaving the planet on that ship with the connection that it has. I just, and I'd be, I, I want to know your thoughts. I want to, I want to know your thoughts on, on all this stuff uh, this week. This is your homework assignment. But if you're, if I'm asking you a question, um, I, I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts. Uh, talk show nerd at gmail.com. And also uh, those comments that you leave on YouTube, I grab all of those. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts on whether or not you think that Disney is intentionally going and putting out misinformation to get the fandom talking about other things, or just to give the fandom something to, to talk about. What do you think about the title, The Only Hope? And what do you think about the possibility that Ray could be a Kenobi? That's the only, that's the only shocking revelation to Ray's backstory that I think actually still is relevant and fits. Right? You can go the, the Ray solo route. It's going to take some, some monkey business to get there. You can do that. Uh, you can go the Ray Skywalker route. Again, it's going to take some monkey business in order to go and get there um, and some mental gymnastics and a lot of explanation. Uh, and it also strips away what I think is at the heart of this whole story, and that is this one-on-one -on -one relationship with these two characters, Ben and Ray. And so I think making them blood-related strips away, obviously, the the potential importance of that relationship. Because if they were... If they were blood related, I feel like that's something that ends up getting talked about in episode eight. It's not something that you hash out in the last one. You can get a revelation of who Ray's parents are and her finding out that that turns out that her grandpa was actually Obi-Wan Kenobi, which brings all of this full circle. And it also makes that whole sort of confrontation with her and Ben Solo even more relevant and and giving it echoes to the to, to the past and i'm really just sort of really riffing off my head right now but i'm i'm curious what you think and how would you how you would feel about that i am convinced and this brings me to one last little uh discussion and then we'll get into listener feedback this week um 
these movies do not get talked about enough when it comes to the influence the director has on the film. And it's I'm not talking about a visual standpoint. Uh, I'm talking about the story and the way the story plays out based off of the the taste of that director. You can watch those other movies and you can clearly see which ones have the firm stamp of George Lucas and which ones don't. The prequels, firm stamp of George Lucas. Easily, one, two, and three are the most um, solid in terms of aesthetics and writing of all the movies. Those three just flow one right into another. George Lucas directed all of them. He deviated a little bit when it came to some of the technical aspects, especially when you get into Attack of the Clones and some of the digital stuff that he did. But in terms of the overall cohesiveness of a trilogy, the prequel trilogy far, um, in a way, outweighs already what's happened with the sequel trilogy and the original trilogy. A New Hope. A New Hope has George's stamp on it. Okay, but what's interesting about A New Hope is that A New Hope also was such a beautiful disaster in the way that film was crafted. If you've watched any of the documentaries about the making of that first Star Wars film, that original rough cut wasn't good of Star Wars that Lucasfilm did. And he brought in these two editors who chopped the the you know used a lightsaber and, and chopped the heck out of that movie in the empire of dreams documentary uh, documentary one of the editors talked about man we were cutting pieces of the film right up until the last frame there were certain frames in the movie where they had to actually go and rock the frame back and forth to get the desired effect when the tuscan raider when the sand person knocks 3po off the off the side of that little cliff in a new hope and it goes, right? And he's got the staff in his hand. That's actually a, a shot that got reversed. So that film is very much George Lucas and has his stamp on it, but it also has a, a, a big, big imprint from the individuals who edit it. Then you get to The Empire Strikes Back, which clearly has the stamp of Lawrence Kasdan, clearly has the visual stamp of... Uh, Irvin um, Kirshner, sorry for the pause there, my my lovely dog came in to say hi to me, as she often does, clearly has a visual stamp and the emotional impact of Irvin Kirshner. Then you get to Return of the Jedi. And Return of the Jedi is interesting to me because while Richard Marquand directed that movie, it's very well documented that George Lucas came in and pretty much did the directing on that film. And of all the original trilogy movies, to me, Return of the Jedi has the most in common with the prequel trilogy. Dialogue, comedy, um, the way the story plays out, the whole nine yards. Now, it makes a little bit of sense when you consider that Return of the Jedi would have been the closest one to the next film that was made, which was The Phantom Menace. Um, that being said, that film still definitely has the stamp of George Lucas. Okay. Then you get to, and let's dive into the, and we'll just stick with the saga films. We won't go with, um, well, well, we can talk, look, briefly on Rogue One and Solo, a Star Wars sto story, this, this, this absolutely rings true as well. Um, Rogue One, uh, oddly, has a lot in common in the terms of how it was made with um, Return of the Jedi, right? About having, you had, you had the director, Gareth, um, Gareth Edwards working on it, but then you had Tony Gibson come in. Uh, and no, Tony Gilroy, sorry, Tony Gilroy, Gilroy come in and do some, some work on it. So it was more of a collaborative effort. Solo, 70% of that movie was reshot. The film that we got, definitely Ron Howard. I mean, that's Ron Howard to a, to an absolute T. Okay. So we get to the sequel trilogy and this is, and this is the point that I want to drive home and then we'll get to some listener feedback. I really, really love the movies that JJ Abrams makes. Okay, And I think one of the big reasons why we identify, and this may all, you may be scratching your head going, yeah, John, well, duh. Um, and that's fine. The point that I'm trying to make is I don't recall this being talked about all that often. So maybe it's just one of these things that 
I personally feel gets taken for granted, even though people have thought of it before, because it obviously makes sense. But when we talk about directors of a film, I don't think we spend enough time looking at it from that's what that director likes. That's his tastes. And when you inject that into Star Wars, okay, and it's somebody from the outside, not a part of Lucas, not George Lucas, right? I think that really kicks open the door for the fandom to have more problems than maybe they did with the other movies. And I'm getting a little wonky on that. Let me pull back and get back to what I'm talking about. I think that J.J. Abrams and I have very similar tastes when it comes to what we enjoy in films. That's what I mean. I think that I have a lot in common with um, James Cameron about what he likes about movies. But talking about Star Wars, the movies that J.J. Abrams makes, they're all infinitely watchable to me. Just across the board, and I've talked about this many times, but the Star Trek movies... Uh, the the first one the the the, the two thousand nine two thousand ten one I can't remember which exact year it was uh, Into Darkness I love both those films Mission Impossible three my favorite Mission Impossible movie and the 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 newer ones are great but that third Mission Impossible film is just a a a a taut action packed movie with fantastic angles and looks great and I think that J J Abrams and I have a lot of similar tastes and that's why. I love that movie so much. Then you get to The Last Jedi, and this all rings true as well. J.J. Abrams made The Force Awakens. He wanted something that was going to delight, and he used Lawrence Kasdan as kind of his muse, and the two of these guys collaborated. Then you get a guy like Ryan Johnson who comes in, and jo Ryan Johnson made a Ryan Johnson Star Wars movie. And, and I've heard uh, Christian Harloff make this comment. Not the biggest fan of The Last Jedi. He's not. I think it's a masterpiece. But he's talked about how... As a Ryan Johnson film, it's a great film. It's just not a great Star Wars movie. I obviously disagree. Ryan Johnson is a required taste. And Ryan Johnson did go and make a Ryan Johnson Star Wars film because he made a movie that was going to delight him. He went and wrote that story based off of the characters that he likes and what he personally wanted to go and put them through. He just injected himself heart and soul into that movie. And this is just another roundabout way of me saying that when you do that, again, you're going to reach the biggest audience that you're capable of reaching. And you are going to adhere yourself to the individuals who appreciate your vision and like the same type of stuff that you do. But the risk that you run is that while you're going to get passionate fans, right, you're also going to get individuals that are going to absolutely hate you for it. And I think that has a lot to do with the backlash of, of what hap what, what's happened with the, with the Last Jedi and those individuals who are just so passionate about it. And you can't search the Episode 9 hashtag on Twitter without just seeing the Ruin Johnson uh, nonsense. And, and I hope that, and again, one day I really hope I can interview Ryan Johnson, but I do hope that, that Ryan Johnson – doesn't get bothered by that because as a as a as a content creator myself, I've injected myself into these stories. Those stories that I've written, the first embark story and uh, the, the 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 next embark story that I'm almost done with the first draft of, and I'm super excited about. Um, those movies are written because I mean, those books are written just because they're filled with all the things that I love. What would I want to see happen next? And then I go and I craft my story. And these directors are doing exactly the same thing. So it makes sense that you know you're not going to have the same taste as a lot of these a lot of these individuals, and they're also not going to get cut any slack because they're not the original creator of the stories. And I think that's where these directors are are given too hard of a time, because I think George Lucas, even though the prequels did get hammered by a lot of people, in retrospect now with these new directors, people hold George Lucas in a lot higher regard than they did during the prequel trilogy prior to the sequel movies, and I certainly believe that that's mostly because a lot of the fandom can't deal with the fact that the creator of the stories isn't involved anymore and so they find it an open opportunity and fair game to go after these new creators of star wars and use it as an excuse rather than just saying my tastes are just different than what ryan johnson did my tastes are just different than the direction that that jj abrams decided to go 
And my gosh, I cannot not talk about The Last Jedi and then just want to go and watch that movie. If you've seen this is a this is really interesting by the way if you get a chance, uh, and I, I I think this is perception more perception than it is uh, anything else. But if you've seen that always trailer that um, Topher Grace put together, um, right? It was Topher Grace? Is that right? Yeah, I was right. I paused the show for a second. Topher Grace. I don't know why that just didn't stick out right. So he's a big Star Wars fan, and he edited together this five minute trailer called up called Always. And it's fantastic. It's a culmination of all the films. It tells the story. Really interesting, though, when he starts intercutting the Last Jedi footage because it really, really sticks out. It sticks out uh, visually from all the other films. The aesthetic of that movie is just visually different. The way that it is shot is way more artistic than the other movies and even has this Almost brown. I've mentioned this before, but it has this sort of brownish hue to the to, to to the whole thing. I love it, but it definitely sticks out when you see a montage of all of the film footage put together. One final thought on this, and the that trailer or that always trailer is is what tossed this little thought into my head. Uh, as a child of these movies, being a fan of Star Wars before I was a fan of anything uh anything at all uh there's certain parts of the original trilogy music visuals that just i mean it it hits you in that nostalgic feel and i'm actually really excited for five ten years down the line looking back at the sequel trilogy and having those same experiences going back and looking at these other movies. It happens for me now watching the prequel trilogy. They all have a feel and a vibe to it. It's a lot like when you listen to music and it sparks a particular memory to this day. I was going through my iPod the other day on shuffle and land on the song that I haven't heard in probably 20 years. And it just instantly took me back. And Star Wars does that for me. And the sequel trilogies don't have the impact right now because it takes time to have that nostalgic impact, right? Right at the end of that trailer, and I wish I should have grabbed the music and I didn't, but right at the, at the end of that Always trailer, the um, he pumped the fanfare for the original Star Wars theme. Dun, 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 dun. I just so, so great. Just hit you just right in the gut. And even without seeing Episode Nine footage, it got me excited for Episode Nine. It got me excited for what J.J. Abrams is going to do, because I think that J.J. Abrams and I would be friends. I think we'd be buds. <laughs> Actually, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that's the case or, a case or not. I do think that J.J. Abrams and I do have a lot of the similar tastes in what we enjoy in our, in our films and storytelling. But be that as it may, I'm not 100% sure that <laughs> we would end up being friends. All right, so I've prattled on now. Prattled. Is that even a word? Prattled? I don't know, but that's what I just did. For 47 minutes, let's get to uh, listener feedback. But before we do, I am surprised at how many new listeners we're getting every single week. So for those longtime listeners and friends of the show, please forgive me while I continue to promote my book. But please take a minute and hear all about my science fiction space opera epic Embark. And I'll be back in just one second to explain where it's available. And then we'll dive right into listener feedback this week. For Earth, the end is near. Only a reluctant hero and the girl he loves have the power to save humanity's future. It's the not-so-distant future, and car culture is replaced by air and space flight, made possible by two of Earth's largest corporations. Flight mechanic Taft Guardia spends his free time racing through the skies with his three best friends and the girl he longs to be with, headstrong Kate Amaro. With the planet on the brink of an industrial apocalypse, a powerful and ruthless corporate madman, Sint Argum, moves to exploit the disaster with his covertly created military. When Taft, Katha, and their friends uncover a shocking secret, Sint Argum will stop at nothing to find them. Time on Earth is running out, but with the help of a ragtag group of young pilots, they'll fight for humanity's future and survival among the stars. My Nerd World. 
Right now, if you go to Amazon.com and you search for Embark, John J O N Justice, you can pick up the ebook for two ninety nine. With the purchase of the ebook, you can get the audio book narrated by me for seven fifty. Paperback is available for thirteen ninety nine. The ebook is free with every purchase of the paperback. I am um, a week away, a week or two away from finishing up the follow up to Embark. If you're on the mailing list, you already know the title and you've seen a bunch of artwork that nobody else has seen yet. If you're not on the mailing list and you'd like to get information about the follow up book, email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. I promise I'm not giving that uh, your address to anybody else other than me. I will not spam your inbox except for information about uh, the stories that I'm writing and sometimes about the podcast uh, itself. Uh, TalkshowNerd at gmail.com. But if you're looking for a way to support this podcast, if you enjoy listening every single week, I would really, really appreciate it if you would uh, pause the show, go to Amazon.com, and pick up the version of your choice or market to read on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, That would be just a fantastic way uh, for you to show your support of the show, and I would really, really appreciate it. It's so awesome to see uh, sales after I put up a I put up a show. It really means a lot, just like you listening to the show and your listener feedback that you provide every single um, week. I need someone to show me my place in all this. Again, talkshownerd at gmail.com. You can leave a comment on YouTube, and I read your listener feedback, and I give you my own personal feedback sometimes. Other times, I just read the next piece of listener feedback. First one comes from uh, Blanca Salazar. You guys have some of the coolest names, by the way. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if they're real, but they're awesome. Sorry. Um, I will finish what you started, Kylo Ren slash Ben. For me, it sounds like ruling the galaxy and maybe have his own family with someone he loves. What uh, Anakin, did, uh, Anakin didn't get to do with Padme before he became um, Darth Vader... I don't know, but probably this uh, is what it sounds like to me. But I can be wrong. Love your podcast. Hashtag uh, Raylo. Thank you, Blanca. Love your name, by the way. Girls with Sabres. Awesome podcast. I've been on it. The ladies are amazing. You should go and check it out. Hey, John. I believe your theories echoes what we discussed last time. We are building Lego, my friend. Remember when we read about Carbon Ridge in Ray's survival guide? Luthien reads the section of the guards still guarding Carbon Ridge, and one of the theories that Ray hears in uh, the washing tables is that they are guarding treasures that Palpatine collected around the galaxy. We discussed this briefly on our podcast, but we passed this like crazy and never really discussed the theories that branch off from this because we were having too much fun. You're absolutely right. Speculating and laughing. LOL. But I believe you brought purpose to that discussion in this podcast. Sorry, not yelling, just being ecstatic because they ended up using all capital letters. Kylo's going to Jakku for those artifacts. It starts around 1356 of our collaboration. If you're interested, I promise that this isn't the shameless plug. No, it can be. Well, at least not intended to be one. It should be. Go and listen to Girls with Sabres. If you're not, you're doing yourself a disservice. They're amazing, and I loved being on their show, and I love the both of them. They even let me do completely inappropriate jokes that I only thought about later on and felt bad about. Probably shouldn't have gone brought that up. <laughs> no, nah, man, go listen to uh, Or Woman. Go uh, go check out Girls with Sabres. They're uh, they're awesome. And you provided me the opportunity to remember part of my uh, my my Kenobi theory. Another reason why I like her being a Kenobi is that because it gives her, um, it brings the story full circle, brings Kenobi back into the mix, and. If we are indeed getting an Obi-Wan Kenobi um, TV show, like has been speculated, that may be announced here in a couple weeks, the Star Wars celebration. Oh my gosh, wouldn't it be awesome if it was a story about how Obi-Wan Kenobi hooked up with somebody and then that person ended up having Ray's mom or dad? That would be great. All right. Simone Wallen Rhodes. Again, what is it with your awesome names? Now I'm going to have to say that all your names are awesome. I'm going to stop here. No more mentioning people and their awesome names for fear that somebody might feel they're left out. I love Girls with Sabres. And you. Oh, Simone, I love you too. But uh, both of your channels are really helping me through this drought. Your theory of approaching the films as history is really great. And honestly, it kind of calms me down when thinking about episode nine. I really don't want to be bitter and salty after watching it. Like all these fanboys are about eight. That said, it's hard for me to imagine Raylo not being Endgame. If it isn't then I just feel like I've completely misread the story of this trilogy. Keep up the uh, the great work. 
I look forward to your videos each week, and I'm impressed how you entertain even when there isn't any Star Wars news. I try, man. I do my best, and sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm good, and then, uh, and then uh, other other times it really it's really you know not uh, not so good, like right now because I was trying to find. Oh, and sometimes it goes like this. This is not going to go the way you think. See, just like I thought that joke was supposed to go. It didn't end up going the way that I thought. Like the way I had it in my head, it totally worked. Not the way that I'd actually play it out on the show itself. I'm not going to edit it, though. I'm going to leave it that way. Kenny Ritchie writes this. Kylo looking pained. This was uh, what one of the individuals at uh, IgerCon said. Uh, peaked, so piqued my interest. Big character development moment incoming for the Dark Prince. Heard somebody talk about how that white room could have been uh, Cloud City. Right? Well, that's interesting. In the footage shown at IgerCon, Kylo Ren Ben Solo, helmet off, was looking into a box that had Vader's helmet in a white room. The individual said it looked off, an awful lot like the inside of the Blockade Runner, and we saw the Blockade Runner in the trailer. What if he went to Clown City? What if, what, what if this is, uh, this is uh, my nerd world, a Star Wars podcast, ASMR? Um, not really. I'm just kidding. But, um, you know, what if he is traveling the galaxy? And because he's traveling the galaxy looking for artifacts from the past, we're revisiting all those places, including Cloud City. How awesome would that be? Man, it would be awesome as long as it looks like Cloud City. Don't go, don't go screwing with it. I will say this: my favorite moment of Rogue One, absolutely true, and I mentioned this before. My favorite moment of Rogue One is when we go to Vader's castle. The only problem I have with going to Vader's castle is that Mustafar does not look like Mustafar looked like in Revenge of the Sith. That's my only problem with it. Now, I'm willing to use my head and, and sort of and, and, you know, rationalize and say, well, you know, at the time, they really, you know, it was a different season on Mustafar, and so there wasn't as much lava, right? But it really didn't look like Mustafar. It should have looked like it looked in Revenge of the Sith. So if they go back to Cloud City, it better look like Cloud City. Uh, one more other example. You know, the Cloverfield movies, not all of them ever good. All of them are kind of entertaining. Really like the first one. But um, at the um, the Paradox one, right? The Cloverfield Paradox or the Paradox Cloverfield. Uh, at the end of it, spoiler alert, the monster shows up from the original Cloverfield movie. He pops his head out of the clouds, but it doesn't look like the original. He looks totally different. It just ruins the moment for me. Uh, and it's just for a film that I probably won't ever watch again, so it really doesn't matter. Let's get back to listener feedback. Um, Haga DC 81 says, Hi, John. Thanks for another great episode. Thank you for the comment. Um, I will finish what you started reading Darth Vader comics. It becomes evident that Vader wants to resurrect Padme and that Vader's castle was built as a key to unlock a portal to another world. I wonder if Kylo wants to re resurrect his favorite Sith. Yeah, I like those theories and I like what was done in that comic without getting into the details of it. That being said, I just don't see them introducing that in the films. I know people have talked about the world between worlds and rebels and how that could be introduced in episode nine and they could use it to jump around the timeline and all that. They're going to be doing that spoiler alert in Endgame. It's kind of obvious. I don't know that for sure. I'm just guessing, but I'm pretty sure they're using the quantum realm. Um, <laughs> that being said, uh, I just don't see them introducing a, a concept that was introduced in the cartoons that not all the fans know and they haven't seen it yet. They're going to be like, what in the world? What, there's doorways and we can travel in time in Star Wars? Nope, that's jumping the shark in my opinion, but I appreciate your comment. Alex writes this, all this episode nine leaks reminds me of Thrawn Alliances. Here's why. I'm sure... Um, we are going to Batu. Batu Batu is in Thrawn Alliances. The whole stuff about Kylo and Vader reminds me of the phrase on the back of the book cover. It's time for Vader to face his past. I got the feeling that this phrase will apply to Kylo, though. You know, I wonder if Kylo fully understands the extent of the story of Anakin Skywalker. What if? Let me go deeper in my theory. Boy, if you're listening, boy, if you're not listening, all the good stuff's coming out in listener feedback this week. So uh, I pity the person that pitched off when my uh, Embark book ad ran. Um, <laughs> what, what if Kylo Ren, in the wake of Snoke, of him killing Snoke, 
goes to seek the truth about what happened with Darth Vader. What if he's not running around collecting artifacts? What if he's running around trying to find out what actually happened to Darth Vader? What if Kylo Ren's journey in the film is actually the journey that we all go on, rediscovering the entire story from beginning to end? What if Kylo ends up going back to all the key pivotal moments of that Anakin had throughout the trilogy? Huh. Sit on that one for a bit. That's really interesting. I like that idea. Right? Like he goes to find, he doesn't go to find himself. He goes to find this thing that he's been trying to become. And in the process, he ends up finding out the story about Anakin and Padme and decides that he doesn't want to go the way of Anakin Skywalker and Darth Vader. Oh my gosh, how amazing would that be? This is the best revelation that I've had the whole entire show. <laughs> that would be, I, I, oh, I almost don't want to dwell on it too much because the idea is too good. You need a catalyst for Ben Solo, though, right? You need something to spur Ben Solo into action, right? Like, he really wants to go, may, maybe, okay, all right, hang with me here, okay? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna work this out, and I may have to hold off on a lot of the listener feedback this week. We'll see. But what if Kylo Ren, he's got the helmet. We know that from the leaked material. What if Kylo Ren really does want to finish what Vader started? But the helmet's not enough. He needs to go just like Ray thought Luke Skywalker was a myth. How much does... And maybe you can help me out because maybe I'm already shooting myself in the foot and it's been discussed already. But for those that have read some of the ancillary material, which is going to matter in this, even though it wasn't in the films, do we know how much Kylo Ren knows about Darth Vader? Do we know yet if Kylo Ren really knows the full story of what happened to Anakin Skywalker in the prequel trilogy? Because if he doesn't, what if Kylo Ren and his thirst for power and anger and to rule the galaxy goes and tries to use Vader as a model? In order to do that, he has to find out everything he can find out about him. And in doing that, right, the MacGuffin of the film we know is supposed to change – what if his full motivation was to become the Dark Lord of the Sith, but in actuality he finds out the real truth going back to the prequel trilogy of who Anakin Skywalker really was and how he fell to the dark side? That also could really fit in well if it turns out that Rey ends up being a distant Kenobi. Because then the two of them can remedy what was failed on or what what failed back in Revenge of the Sith when Anakin turned to the dark side and was and was cut down by Obi-Wan Kenobi. You are my brother, Anakin. I loved you. Right? Oh my gosh, I love that theory. That's really good. I'm gonna change the title of the podcast now. Theory to end all no, nah, well, theory to end all theories. But that really is a a really good theory. Now you have more to send me stuff about i almost want to move it to the beginning of the podcast i may tag the beginning of the podcast if you hear something at the very beginning of the podcast mentioning this and you're hearing this now you know that i ended up adding it in i sounded drunk there right? i ended up adding it in because i've had too many spike blue mills and i got this amazing Ben solo theory and it still fits with Raylo. <laughs> i really am i honestly i haven't had anything to drink today i'm it's it's the four nineteen in the afternoon. The afternoon. I apologize. I love that theory, though. Kylo Ren goes on a fact finding mission, wanting to become Darth Vader, only realizing what actually happened to Anakin, and decides he doesn't want to go the way that Anakin went, and that ends up cementing his relationship with Padme as those two come together. Oh my gosh! And she's a relative of Kenobi. That would be amazing. All right, I almost want to stop right there. I'll do a few more, a few more listener feed feedbacks this week. Cortex Zero, early morning nerd world podcast. Sheesh, says Cortex. Happy weekend, John. Writing a sci-fi novel myself. The idea came to me while I was in that really cool state between being awake and asleep, hence why I will be checking out Embark. Uh, they were responding to the comment they had on uh, on last week's uh, last week's show. Uh, I really do hope that you pick up the book. I, I'm, I'm so excited for the follow-up book. And I keep saying it over and over again. But, um, 
you know, if you like the first book, the, fir- the first half of the first book, I got to set the world stage. And so arguably it's the slowest part of the book. And almost unanimously, people say the second half of the book really takes off and they love the ending. I love this other story that I'm writing right now. I can't wait to get it out there. But hopefully you've gone and picked up, uh, picked up Embark already on Amazon. Search for John J.O.N. Justice and Embark. Amanda writes, I just love that people are promoting how amazing The Last Jedi was. You're awesome. Thank you, Amanda. I think you're awesome, too, and you're a friend of the show. I'm with you. The more I watch the movie, the more I love it. Sure, there are parts that I tend to skip over. That's because I'm all about that Raylo. I was watching a video by Lords of the Sith last night, and they were talking about how this is the Skywalker saga. So really, these movies are all about Kylo slash Ben. I thought Ryan Johnson did a fantastic job with his character development. I absolutely agree. I love bows, writes this. I'm a shill. You're a shill. Everyone's a shill. Ryan Johnson had a farm. (laughs) <laughs> thank you i love bows uh black eyed lily says i love being designated as a friend of the show because you are a friend of the show black eyed lily i also enjoyed your guest appearance on girls with sabers i did too i hope they invite me back seems like they were taken off guard that i agreed i'm just a yahoo i'm just a dude who sits behind a microphone that talks about star wars for over an hour to, to you and to myself and my dog Say hi to Bella. All right. Uh, Sky Traffic says, indeed. Um, let's see. They're running around that base. Well, I noticed that, too. It's so funny. Like, they're, oh, 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 okay. So he's, uh, so, so he or she is, uh, is responding to last week's episode when I mentioned all the running around that takes place on Dakar when they, uh, when they arrive back in The Force Awakens and how once you see everybody running, you can't unsee it. Everybody's running. It makes no sense. There, there are no fires. There's no reason for everybody to be running around. Oh, all right. Um, I'm going to save. There's one here. There's, an, a, there's a really nice email that I got from Amanda Bienko. Uh, writes this. I'm going to save the this. I want to spend some time with this uh, with this email on next week's show because I'm, I'm running a little bit short on time now. So I'll read you just a, just a little bit of it. Love your podcast so much. It's nice to have somebody who is positive about The Last Jedi and Star Wars in general. With the negativity out there, it's wonderful to see people who can be so positive. Uh, growing up, I really... I didn't really know Star Wars. I watched the prequels and I knew about Darth Vader being Luke's father, but I even watched before I even watched the original trilogy, but I really didn't get into loving Star Wars until TFA. The Last Jedi was amazing. I love the movie so much, not just because of the Raylo Force bond, but mostly because of the character drivenness and the focus on Ben Solo. He was my favorite character after leaving The Force Awakens. And even more so after watching The Last Jedi. I'm going to save the uh, the rest of Amanda's email because she goes on to write some really great stuff that, again, I want to be able to um, to spend some some time on because uh, I'm running short on this week's podcast. So a few more a few more comments. Um, Sky Drathic is back and says, The Ways of the Force, this is the best title that I've heard yet. It isn't cheesy. It's not revealing. And it can be interpreted very differently uh, because I do not think most people will see the end of Episode Nine coming. I dearly, dearly hope that Raylo was J.J.'s plan from the beginning, since there really is a lot of evidence pointing towards that. And J.J. is always telling in interviews very intently that the backlash did not influence the plot of Nine. If you think about him talking about the Ray and Ben idea it would make sense because they kept the story. Uh, thank you, as always, for the comment. I agree. Don't particularly like um, Ways of the Force all that much, but I do appreciate your, um, your, your comment. Uh, let's see. Uh, Stephanie writes, thanks for reading my comment. Also, Raylo is the end game. You're very welcome. Um, and let's go ahead and stop here. I got a couple more lengthier, uh, pieces of, um, of email of people that have written. And I really, uh, want to be able to take time because when you take the time to write out these lengthy emails, I really want to spend time going through what you had to say, because it means a lot that you took time to write. So, uh, individuals, Bonnie, uh, Ryan, um, Amanda, a few individuals that have left comments on, on YouTube. Uh, forgive me for not getting to your email this week, but I will um, address your emails again next week. I save all of these and really look forward to next week's show being able to work through all the, the wonderful content that you wrote to me. I really do uh, appreciate that. Talkshownerd at uh, gmail.com. One more just quick plug for, uh, for Embark. Again, uh, if you or a friend you know uh, are, uh, are, are readers and science fiction fans, I hope you'll go and check the book out. And if you have already, thank you. If you haven't left a review, go to Amazon.com, search John J.O.N. Justice, and uh, drop me a positive review uh, of the book. 
cannot wait to get this next book out, man. So, so excited. Uh, really, really hope um, and, and pray that you guys who have enjoyed the first book like the follow-up book. Again, I should have the, uh, the first draft done here in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, we're off to editing. I already have the cover almost finished. I got the title. I haven't released yet. I'm pulling a J.J. Abrams. I'll be doing that soon. Amazon.com. Search John J.O.N. Justice, and you can find it there. What do you think about that theory? I like that theory a lot. I think it's good. I'm going to put that at the beginning of the podcast and back in the liner notes as well. So uh, back next week, looking forward to all of your listener feedback. Uh, Until then, uh, may the force be with you. And here is Obi-Wan Kenobi to say it in just a slightly uh, different way. The force will be with you always. My nerd world.